Okay. Uh, this is gonna be short and sweet. We only have two. We could have had like three or four, but I said, you know, um, fuck it. Let's just do two. That's very easy. And we may only have two next week too, potentially, because there is a big rumor that uh, second best exotic we are going to tell will not come here. We will have black sea with you, law. Yeah, that's right. Yes. I saw that. Uh, which I'm very excited to see, actually. It's available now. I am a huge Drew Law fan. But in the meantime, um, we get Will Smith. Because we're going to start with Focus. Uh, which is not to be confused with the William H. Macy movie from, like, 2001. Where he is the Jewish guy that, like, faces, you know, prejudice. It had meatloaf in it. It's a, pr it's a pretty fascinating movie, but it's, you know, hit and miss. Or autofocus. Yeah, this, yeah. If you want to throw that in A there local too. theater decided when they were promoting this oh, movie. Oh, yes, yeah. That's what the reason I brought it up. <laughs> they were using the poster for autofocus to promote this movie. Yeah, they, they fuck up a lot. Frozen is the best one, so, I think. That I think that happened in more than one theater, though. I think yeah. a lot of people did that. Okay, so anyway, um, we're going to start with Focus, um, which is Will Smith's new movie. Um, also starring Margot Robbie and written and directed by the guys that wrote Bad Santa. Uh, <laughs> it's an interesting uh, group there. Yeah. Um, and my first thought was why he would do a movie. It seemed like a weird choice for him. Because it wasn't, you know, a drama that would get him Oscar attention. It wasn't a big action movie. And it wasn't a flat out comedy. Mm -hmm. um, it just seems like a movie that's just kind of here. And it seems it just seems like a weird place for him to go now. Especially after, you know... After Earth. Maybe he's like laying low after After Earth or something. I don't know. But He extremely hated for that movie. Um, the story is pretty simple. He's one of those two cool for school con men that walks around in his sunglasses and, you know, you know, pickpockets people and, you know, pulls off scores while, you know, jazzy music play. <laughs> I did say Will Smith's going to play Danny Ocean in this movie before we even started. And then um, he meets another con artist who is Margot Robbie, and um, they fall in love, and that uh, fucks up his plans. So, um, oh, right, well, going into the movie, I was wondering, you know, what would make him take a part like this. But then once the movie started going, I realized, oh, I see. So um, the date doctor business finally fell through for Hitch, so now he is a thief. I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, got it. Um, not sure what happened to Eva Mendez, you know, because, you know, well, Ryan Gosling got her now, maybe that's what happened. See, she's flowing through from that character to real life, and yes. Um, now, okay, I kind of wasn't taking this movie that seriously going into it, because there are a lot of movies like this that I have uh, made fun of in the past. Yeah. There's this running joke we have from forever ago when that movie Duplicity came out with Clive Owen and Julia Roberts. Uh, I don't even remember what the fuck happened in that movie, but we saw it. <laughs> but the whole time going into it, I was just making fun of it because I was like, this is going to be one of those movies where everybody acts all cool and shit and then, you know, it plays itself up as one thing and then, oh, they were actually pulling off a big, you know, con on somebody and the music's going to cue in and they're going to smugly smile to each other as they get away with it. And the audience is going to go, oh man, this movie's too smart for me. And it's just... <laughs> and, yeah, it's, it's its own genre, really. And I was pretty much under the impression that this is one of those movies. And it pretty much is, but not as... Smarmy. Oh, let's, 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 let's go into it. Um, for starters, um, the two leads here... Um, Will Smith and Mario Robbie are, like, two of the best-looking people on the face of the earth. Yeah. So, when they were together doing their thing, in any other movie, I kind of feel like, you know, this is forced and this is trying to be way too... It's trying to be a lot smoother than it is. Um, but, you know, for the most part, um, they kind of... They're quite on fire in each other's presence. Yeah. Um... To the point that I actually had an issue here, um, I have to think of a way to say this that doesn't make me sound like a complete tool, <laughs> but, um, cause it might, yeah, just hear me out. Um, it might sound exaggerated, um, but I'm being totally serious here. Um, yeah, I don't, I kind of somewhat praise Margot Robbie for The Wolf of Wall Street. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but that was kind of the extent of it. I was more focused on the rest of the movie that was going on. Um, however, I had a different reaction to Margot Robbie while watching Focus. And that was um, the fact that I realized, in retrospect, her casting is brilliant. They could not have picked a better person, a better person for this role. Because here's the thing. Um, I don't know if anybody had, like, she's still relatively new. Like, if you haven't seen The Wolf of Wall Street, I'm not sure you could put a face with her name right away, anyway. Uh, she had a small part in About Time, and I think she was in something else that I'm drawing a blank on. And she's making news because she, she's going to be Harley Quinn and everything, but... Um, Margot Robbie is so attractive that I found it distracting. <laughs> In the first, like, half hour or so of the movie are the scenes with her and Will Smith doing their little witty banter. Um, and because... I know it sounds stupid, but listen. Uh, <laughs> Margot Robbie is so goddamn amazingly beautiful that when I was looking at her on screen, I could not concentrate. <laughs> like, there's, there's things but, going on right now, but I have no idea what they are. Yeah, like, I could not focus on the rest of the movie around her. But, once again, though, looking back, that is a brilliant casting choice because that's the way her character works. Mm -hmm. Like, her character uses to her advantage the fact that, you know, while she's distracting people with her beauty, she's doing things that they can't see. She's the master of honey potting. So, <laughs> if we're going to go back into the interview territory. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um... So, I don't know what to say about her performance <laughs> itself, but god damn it, she was a great casting choice. It's like a double-edged sword for her performance that way, <laughs> considering it made you lose yeah, all like, track of everything. It's like, she's not, I'm not saying she's bad at anything, I'm no? just telling you, there's not a whole lot I can tell you about the performance itself. <laughs> um, and I don't know what that says, but, um, and yeah, Will Smith is really good here. Obviously, you know, he's a fantastic actor that... Doesn't always pick the projects that lets him show that. Yep. But when he does, you know, he'll really, really, really bring it. Um, now, the issue here is that you've seen this. There's. I wrote down a few movies that came to mind. I don't know if you've seen any of these because all of the none of them are wide releases. Um, there was Ryan Johnson's The Brothers Bloom mm -hmm. um, with Ruffalo and Adrian Brody. There is Criminal with John C. Riley, Diego Luna, and Maggie Gyllenhaal. And there's The Last Time with Michael Keaton and Brenda Fraser. Um, and so many more, but those are the few that came to mind. And if you've seen those movies, or any movie like this, um, I don't know how you're going to feel about this, because it's one of those movies where it always feels like it's not the... okay. The movie that came to mind was Now You See Me. But just ignore that because this is not as bad as Now You See Me. And he not hates that movie. Yeah. Uh, we're going to get a lot of hateful comments on this video just because I said this one sentence about Now You See Me. Watch that happen, I swear to God. Obviously, I, I like it. Um, just me. I cannot fucking stand that movie because, I know. like you said, I don't know who saw that review I did a year or two ago, but that... Those movies where they just keep feeling like you're they're a step ahead over and over and over again, when you have long since put it in your brain that they have done that shit so much in the movie already, you already have your mind set that pretty much everything you see in this movie is probably a con in one way or another. Yeah. And it just stops you from giving a shit. <laughs> because it just it keeps thinking it can fool you with the same shit over and over and over again. But when it does it the first couple of times, you kind of start to figure it out and you can be ahead of the movie. When it, the movie thinks it's so ahead of you, when in actuality you're at the end, when it's, you know, sitting, still in the middle going, oh, have I fooled you yet? And it just kind of keeps going uh, <laughs> on, yeah. that, on that path through the whole movie. Um, and I was ready to dismiss it for a while there. Like, I was ready to just say, all right, this is all this movie is. I'm, I'm kind of done with it now. Now I just have to wait for it to end. But then a scene happened that brought it back to life. Um, the scene where they meet B.D. Wong at the football game. Yes. <laughs> um, I love this scene, actually. It's a really cool scene. And it's a really, it's a really long centerpiece scene. Um, and I won't say what happens, but 
um, the movie still drops the ball. Because here's the thing. Um, the way this scene plays out is it starts off as something really small, uh, but intriguing. Mm -hmm. And then it builds, and then it keeps building and building and building. And it gets really, really, you know, fun to watch. Like, you, you're really just not sure where the stakes are going and how far it's going to go. And how bad whoever is fucking up in the scene is fucking up. <laughs> um, and it's a great, great scene. Until the final payoff. The very final payoff. Yeah. The very final payoff is so far-fetched that it just kind of... They had something really great going on and then they squander it at the last minute for this payoff that, you know... It's a great idea, but it's not believable at all. If Jemaine Clement in character as Boris the Animal walked on screen and Will Smith had to start fighting him, I would have found this maybe more believable than this little payoff they gave us. Cause they, I think they tried this shit in one of the Ocean movies too. Yeah, the like same kind of payoff with Andy Garcia, I believe. But it just, no, that just that kind of brought it down. But the thing about that is, um, it's worth noting that the movie is in two separate parts, and the second part that leads <laughs> us into the second part, and the second part um, sets up a new storyline. But the movie gets really, really redundant from there. It kind of felt like the, we were just kind of stuck in the same loop there for a while. Mm -hmm. And had to wait until it got closer to the end for, you know, a point to be made. Um, and from then on, it starts to kind of feel like it... I'm trying to figure out how to explain this. I had it in my head last night while I was watching it. Think of the older Bond movies. And then you have... Um, in the older Bond movies, you had the action scenes. And then you had the scenes in between. Imagine going into one of those older Bond movies and taking out all the scenes in between the action scenes where, like, you know, Bond goes to see, like, fucking Polo be played or something. Um, and that's what this movie is made up of. <laughs> um, you know, like, the, like, the scene at the racetrack, I was sitting there thinking, like, is this a deleted scene from Review to a Kill? One of the lower scenes? <laughs> um, but, you know... Now, here's a big issue. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, like I said, you have, you know, the chemistry kind of between Will Smith and Margot Robbie, and you have how appealing they are as while being the two leads. Um, but then, and, you know, the movie has a nice style to it as well. It's got a nice look, and, you know, it's relatively well put together. And it for a while there, it keeps itself apart from just another, you know, wannabe con movie. Um, it kind of keeps it above, its head above water there for a while. And then the final reveal happened. <laughs> and normally, it's, it takes a lot for my opinion to totally shift just because of the last ten minutes of a movie. But here's the problem, is you're in these... You know, once again, you've seen enough movies to know this. When you're watching these kind of movies, you know that no matter how close you get to an ending, or how many big reveals there are, this kind of movie is not going to rest and is not going to let you leave the theater until they give you one final fuck you. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and you just have to wait for that to happen, because you know it's coming. And in this particular case, once it, at this point in the movie, I was thinking, you know, like, all right, it's fine. It's just barely, you know, hanging on. It's not bad, per se. But as we got close, something happened. And then I was, you know, thinking. I realized what was going on in this scene, what was being said, and the way it was set up. And I was thinking, well, this is clearly going to be what that's going to be. But they wouldn't go there, right? Because that is just too fucking stupid. They are not stupid enough to do that, right? Um, even, you know, in a desperate attempt for the absolute biggest payoff they can come up with. Um, <laughs> needless to say, um, I was almost kind of surprised by how, um, correct I was in guessing what that was. Because I thought, I thought it was too dumb to be real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh, okay, it really was that obvious. It even shouldn't be, that kind of thing should not be obvious. And it was. And that just, 
yeah, that last ten minutes just really, really took it to a place where I said, oh, fuck this. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, there are moments in there, and, you know, they keep it, you know, resuscitated as much as they can. But then the ending is just... You kept it alive for that. <laughs> Come on. Okay, so... Yeah, it's not bad. It's not a bad movie or anything no. at all. Um, and there are some scenes in it that are really good. But, um... No, it, it fucks itself over one too many times. Um, and yeah, it's just one of those... The whole time, you pretty much just know... Like, the movie keeps thinking it's smarter than you and it's ahead of you. But if you have even the slightest brain in your head, you can... You can pretty much tell exactly what's off. So, that's a bummer. Um, and not to mention, um, there were a couple... I mean, I could be, you know... Maybe, possibly, there are some things I'm not thinking of where it could work. But that final reveal that they do... Mm. Um, there are a couple of scenes in this movie that are decent. I can't talk about them now. I was going to earlier, but I can't now because <laughs> I've gone too far. But... Um, there are a couple of scenes in the movie that are really good, um, that are rendered totally pointless yeah. after the twist. <laughs> like, why were those scenes like that now that we know what was really going on? Um, but uh, I guess the movie didn't care about that. As long as it feels like it fooled you at the very last second and you're walking out going, man, that movie fucked with my head. That's all they wanted. So, yeah, that's, that's a bummer. Um... It had potential. The potential was clearly there. Yeah. Um, but they only... They they rarely went for it. So, that's kind of a, a letdown in its entirety. Okay. Um, our second movie is the... Um, oh, something I wanted to bring up real quick. That's a funny anecdote. Um, what, uh, I don't watch the trailers. Everybody knows that now. Um... So I hear, I just shut my eyes because I can't, you know, avoid them any other way, really, or I'd, you know, miss the beginnings of movies. But um, I hear trailers, but I don't see them. And the first trailer, this movie, for a long time, um, is not what I thought it was. <laughs> because there is a moment in the first trailer, and it's the scene in the movie where um, Will Smith is at the, uh, the gaming table, and he's... <laughs> I guess because, you know, he's one of the only black guys in there. Um, there's a moment where he screams the line, where are all the black people? Well, when I heard this in the trailer for the first time, I did not know what the movie was about. I had no idea what the context of that was or what the rest of the story was. The only thing I remember from the trailer was Will Smith screaming, where are all the black people? And the fact that I had seen the William H. Macy movie of the same title that was also about prejudice. Uh, not also about, but was about prejudice. So, in my head, I heard that line, and I knew the title of the movie, and my mind went to, is this a movie where Will Smith lives in a world where all of the black people have suddenly disappeared, and he's the only one Because <laughs> there's a movie that nobody saw. It's a terrible movie, too. Um, it's called A Day Without a Mexican, and that's the setup for it. <laughs> Um, without, well, with Mexicans, obviously. Um, so yes, that's just a funny anecdote that for a little while there, that's what I thought this movie was. Yeah. <laughs> Told me that story and I was like, okay. Because that's, that's the only line I remembered when I heard it in the trailer. <laughs> so my mind just kind of gradually went there. So yes, that's what that was. <laughs> okay, our second movie is The Lazarus Effect. Um... This should be an interesting review because it's going to kind of be, it's going to be like a ping pong match. Yep. Uh, there's some things about this movie that are great, and there's a lot of things that aren't. And I guess we're just going to kind of keep bouncing back and forth about whether or not this movie is good or whether it sucks. I don't really know. Because <laughs> we were sitting there watching the credits roll, and I was like, we're going to have to do a review on this for me to figure out if I like it or not, because I don't know right now. <laughs> and even sometimes after the fact, you <laughs> like or dislike movies more after you've already done the review. Yeah. So, let's just find out what I think about this. Let's do this together. <laughs> um, so, 
the story, um, I got a lot of Hollow Man vibes from this. Yeah. Um, we start off with, um, we're dealing with animals. Uh, we start off with a pig, but the main attraction is the dog. Um, the dog has been put to sleep, and they're going to, um, use this serum to bring it back to life. Um, which of course, you know, Lazarus, the whole rising from the dead thing, mm. the Bible thing, and, uh, don't forget the Lazarus machine from Casper. Lazarus Pitt and Batman. Yes! <laughs> So, uh, wow, this isn't ever used at all. Nope. So, <laughs> <laughs> and it used to be a store in the mall many, many years ago. So anyway, um, their subject is a dog that's just been put to sleep. And it works, but he's kind of cujoing out. So they're trying to figure this out. And while they're continuing their experiment on this, Olivia Wilde is um, electrocuted and killed. And her husband or boyfriend, I don't remember what he was, um, it's bro not really made. Yeah, Mark Duplass. She wears a ring, but I can't tell if it was a wedding ring or an engagement ring. But um, so Mark Duplass brings her back to life, um, but she's not the same. Um, and she's kind of Carrie. She's kind of the devil. She's kind of whatever the fuck. Uh, <laughs> something is off. Now, okay. The interesting thing about this movie. Uh, to talk about first is the genre is hard to place. Mm -hmm. For starters, um, I was under the impression it was just a horror movie. From the sounds of the trailer, I was like, well, that's a horror movie. <laughs> but we went in, and I, I had heard some, you know, combating things, though, because you look on IMDb, and I think it says, like, sci-fi and thriller and stuff like that. So that was weird. And then we go in, and I'm, t I'm trying to guess, you know, what trailers will be on. It's like, oh, that unfriended and poltergeist are on this. Um, but it was, like, sci-fi movies, like Chappie and The Avengers. <laughs> it's like, does, do people think it's sci-fi, or do people think it's horror? It's hard to tell. I'm guessing so, our film booker thinks it's sci-fi. Just like, um, Hollow Man's the same way. Is yeah. Hollow Man sci-fi or horror? <laughs> but the thing is, is, um, I th Hollow Man's more of a thriller. Yeah. Um, the thing is, though is it does one relatively well and one not so well. Um, and it goes back and forth. It's not like one half is one thing and one half's the other. They kind of keep switching the genres on us throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I found that a little odd. The beginning is really atmospheric, though. Like, they're really setting something up. But the issue here is that they keep throwing in horror shit amidst what this jump scares and this atmospheric horror, this atmospheric thriller thing, sci-fi thriller thing seems to be, like the moment where um, Donald Glover sneaks up on her in the lab for a jump scare wearing a pig mask, and that, is that there a was nothing there was nothing horror about the movie at all. They were just gonna kind of throw the horror shit in there. Amidst the thrill of the angle. It's flatliners. They were making fucking flatliners, is what they were doing. Um, but it's just. I don't know. Once again, though, much like flatliners was, you know, a thriller, um, it's like they threw horror shit in place of the thriller shit. <laughs> um, it's true. And it, it made it this really weird concoction, um, which is weird because the movie does have a lot of things going for it. Well, it has a lot of other things not. For instance, let's start with the acting. Um, the supporting players are just kind of there, even though they are recognizable faces like Donald Glover and Evan Peters, but um, the two leads are Mark Duplass and Olivia Wilde. Um, this, not that this is news to anybody, or particularly me, but while watching this, the one thing I kept thinking was, Mark Duplass is a really good actor. Yeah. Because the weird thing about it is his style in his indie movies and the movie he, the movies he makes with his brother are the fact that they feel, like, natural and, like, improvised, mm. whether they're scripted or not. That's the, I have no idea how close his movies stay to their scripts because they feel, they feel so improvised. And even in something like this, when Mark Duplass is speaking, it feels like he's just improvising. Well, he, I'm sure he's clearly reading a script because of the lines that he has. But he has this way of delivery where it just feels like he's improvising all the time. And it's really cool how he can do that. He needs a lot more mainstream, like, leading roles. Hmm. And then Olivia Wilde, who I've... Pretty much every movie she's had, the past five movies or so, I've been praising her. She seems to just keep getting better and better. 
because I was I was so dismissive over there for a while, like when Burt Wonderstone was out. <laughs> um, but she's really good. like it's not like you know I mean it's not like Oscar worthy material anyway. Then like um, like I would have given her you know awards praise for last year for Better Loving Through Chemistry in third person, despite how shitty third person was as a movie in general. Um, she's really good at being scary. I, yeah, <laughs> like I wasn't I wasn't planning on that. <laughs> But she can be really creepy. She can do it really effectively. <laughs> um, it's also worth noting, I kind of like the poster, too. Where it's like her face and then it has the white border. The white border is like really... It felt really old school. Kind of like The Terror Within. Yeah. An another really shitty movie about a lab that goes wrong. But still, it felt, you know, like 80s shit. Um, which I kind of like to embrace. Um, however... Um, they just keep going back to things that don't work every time they do something that does. Um, like, okay, one of the support... Okay, um, Evan Peters' character, um, he's the... Okay, this is where we kind of lose our characters a little bit because, you know, he's capable of, you know... he. I mean, I haven't really loved him in anything except for Days of Future Past, but that was more the character than the mm -hmm. performance, I think. Um, here, he's just kind of given the character trait where he's the douchebag. Like, he... Okay, so he's had this really acclaimed work, like an American Horror Story and Days of Future Past and stuff like that. And then he's put in this movie, and one of his first lines is, um, we're introduced to our, our camera girl that they have brought in, and she goes off to do something, and the character exchanges we get here are Evan Peters is talking to Donald Glover about her, and he actually says the line, yeah, I'd tap that. Would you tap that? I'd totally tap that. I'm like, really? This is what you're giving your characters to work with? Nice. He's also a, a smoker. Those are his character traits. He's a douchebag and he smokes. <laughs> well. It's like, Greg Grunberg in Hollow Man had more character traits than this. What are you thinking? Um, I could tell you what every character in Hollow Man did. Kim Dickens and Joey Slotnick. I can tell you what they all did in Hollow Man. Uh, Evan Peters is the guy that would tap that in smokes. <laughs> he also looks like he's the reject from Cabin in the Woods. So, um, now another thing um, that sucks about this is we have the soundtrack. And I don't mean the music. <laughs> this is one of those movies where once Olivia Wilde comes back and she does the black eyes thing and she does the weird staring and the, you know, she'll play innocent after she's just, you know, brutally murdered somebody. You know, just playing with the little red blanket that she's got on her. Um, there, she will do things and the soundtrack will do things with her. Let's start with when she first rises. There is a moment where she just grabs Mark Duplass's arm and the soundtrack is of a girl screaming. And it's not like that has any significance. It's just the horror, the generic horror noise they went for. <laughs> Haunted house like score. Because it happened more than once. <laughs> yeah. Anytime her character would do something that was supposed to be creepy or scary, the soundtrack would literally scream. <laughs> You'd have brought back the record player too. Uh, yeah. How many different horror movie things did this thing do? And then there's the moment... Sometimes, sometimes it works. There's the, the shot that I liked, even though it's not necessarily original by any means, um, where she's in the mirror, she's looking in the mirror, and the mirror, like, breaks itself because she has powers or something. Uh, and she... There are two different reflections of her. The, the one in the full mirror is, like, the innocent, scared one. And the refl the other reflection next to her reflection she sees in the broken portion is, like, smiling evilly. Um, that was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, it just kept... Yeah. For a while there, even even when they were throwing in the unnecessary horror shit amidst the, the setup, um, it still felt, you know, relatively smooth in the setup. Like, it actually felt like it could have been something that was worth watching. Um, but then once it reaches that moment in the middle, um, where it decides to just go full horror, um, it kind of loses its way. Um, and goes for a lot of 
you know, typical, it's, there, it's not like, I don't mean ghost ghosts, but I mean, you know, the, you can stop the ghost or the supernatural spirit with some easy, you know, solution mm. that, you know, would give something from the past a happy ending. It goes into that shit. Um, and then, um, speaking of things, speaking of taking things from other horror movies, this movie turns into an Elm Street movie. Yep. Completely. L listen to this. Listen to this. Let me tell you this. Um, what happens here is when Olivia Wilde died uh, by being electrocuted, and in between the time they brought her back, we're supposed to assume that she visited hell. Um, which, you know, she kept having dreams about because of something from her past. She keeps having dreams of people trapped in a burning building. Um, now, the thing about it is she keeps having those dreams, right? And, you know, we have scenes of her waking up and, you know, not being able to sleep in the middle of the night. And then we get these images of burning dolls. Um, and a little girl doing the, the hushed you know, gesture. Uh, a, a little girl standing at the foot of a burning hallway with burning dolls around her. And then the camera girl is somehow brought into this dream. And, you know, things happen within the dream. And then when she goes back out of the dream, her arm is burned still from inside the dream. Yeah. And they asked her what happened. I actually expected her to say... There was this evil man in a red and green sweater and a brown hat and a horribly burned face and his hand was not. <laughs> it's the only thing that was missing, I swear to God. It really was. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't really know what to think because there were some things that I really liked, but then it just kept getting bogged down with bad shit. I don't know. Um... There's, I will say this, something that really did help, um, is, uh, I thought the ending was cool. I'm sure people will probably, you know, hate it for one reason or another, because that's just what you do with the ending of the world. Yeah, movies. I liked it. Um, yeah, I like, I like the, I like the direction they took that. Uh, it's pretty wicked. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not what you're expecting, either. Um, I'm sure if you think about it hard enough, you'll probably figure it out, but while watching it, I, my mind wasn't going there, but nope. it's like... Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, so, yeah. But overall, you know, there's an awful lot of the, the shit that doesn't work. There's a lot of those scenes where not only do they have, like, the screaming soundtrack and the characters just scaring other characters for the sake of it. Um, there's moments where, you know, there'll be noise and everything will be really, really quiet. And you know where the thing is coming from because the person is on, like... Right, it's like a Tom Hooper shot from The King's Speech. Um, the the person is right over here on the very edge of the frame, and the whole other frame, the rest of the frame is open. So you know the person is coming from over there, um, and the camera's gonna pan over there really fast. That happens way too many times than it should. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I don't know. I still I don't know. Um, I don't know. The ending left me on kind of a high where I think I might have. I liked it. I liked it better thirty-three minutes ago than I do now. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. There's some things that work in there. Mark Duplass and Olivia Wilde really, really, you know, do what they can um, and actually give effective performances in it. Believe it or not, um, but I don't know. The balance is a little too. The balance is a bit uneven. It'd be more forgivable if they at least found an even balance, but. And they made it, you know, to where, like, it's a decent, it's a, it's a fairly decent sci-fi thriller stuck inside a really poorly made horror movie. And it's just a lot of really fighting things going on. If you took the horror aspects of the movie out and just made it a sci-fi thriller, I think it would have worked really well. Uh, maybe, like, something uh, Mike Cahill would do or something, if you take the horror out. But, yeah, that's... And I swear to you, I did not know that Donald Glover was in the movie when we were having the Spider-Man conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're done here. Uh, they're both getting two stars. Alright, that makes it easy. <laughs>
uh, very middling uh, movie week. <laughs> yeah, um, next week we have Chappie, Unfinished Business, and uh, potentially the second best exotic Marigold Hotel. And uh, It's going to be Dev Patel weekend. Yeah, maybe. I heard he's in Chappie, is that true? No, he, oh, he definitely is. Okay. <laughs> he, he's the... It, the more to the short circuit gimmick, it really works mm-hmm. really well. And he plays that character pretty much to a day. Um, no Steve Gutenberg, it's Hugh Jackman. So, <laughs> should be fun. <laughs> Chappie would be fun. It's rated R, it's, it's going to be... It's Bomb Camp. It should be, should be fun. Looking forward to it. Okay. So that being said, uh, thank you guys and girls out there for watching. Uh, tomorrow, Ashley returns Gaming with Ash. Sunday, brand new verses. Your cryptic code name is High School. And Monday, our final opinions on the 2015 Academy Awards. The entire procedure, the entire ceremony, and pretty much figuring out who won between AJ Ashley and myself in the pop challenge. I'm sure you already know, but we're going to talk about it as he smiles evilly. So that means Did that, you doubt it, really? Yeah, really. But I, I kind of doubted what happened on Sunday night. But we'll talk about that on Monday. So that being said, thank you guys and girls out there for watching. And AJ, any parting words?